Support for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by The Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And The Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscriptions available at bakerstreetjournal.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, Episode 69, Sherlock Holmes on Radio. Part two. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a strumming man. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the Baker Street Irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! What a great time it is to return to us here, return to the days of yesteryear <laughs> with Scott Monty, that's me. And Bert Wolder, the faithful Tonto. Indeed. Here His on faithful Iger. Indian companion. Oh, big, big chief, big chief Wolder. <laughs> um, here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. Yes, or at least half past 1895, depending Somewhere. on when we get started. Somewhere in there. And, of course, we've risen past 1895 on our Sherlock Holmes community. I think we did, uh, the moment we, we recorded that, I think we were already past 1895. So hmm. good to see some growth over there. Yeah. Is John Watson's blog still stuck at 1895 viewers, I wonder? I think it is. Hmm. I think it is. But we have surpassed that. Good. It's nice. Um, but last time, we left you on a cliffhanger. <laughs> yes. And as with any good serial whether it's in radio or television or movies. Or in, your, we are. Or in your breakfast bowl. And yeah, yeah, wah, wah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we want to get back to uh, our guest. But before we do that, uh, uh. because you folks pay for this stuff. You know, we're, we provide a service and you expect the best. And we're here with all of the ways to contact us, such as I hear of Sherlock.com, our comprehensive website of news, information, roundups, perspectives, opinions, all sorts of fun stuff on our comprehensive website. Mm. Yes, from everything from Sherlockian socks to manuscripts to Sidney Paget can be found at I hear of Sherlock.com. But if that's not enough, if you're not, you say you're not satisfied, you say you want more ways to contact us. Call us, please, 774-221-READ, 774-221-7323, or at our IHearOfSherlock.com website. You can also leave an audio comment there, or start a rumor. Go down to a nearby supermarket, the Stop and Shop. Be sure to stop before you shop, and find a cashier and just ask her if she's heard about IHearOfSherlock.com. And then, without an appreciable pause, ask her about the price of peaches and see what happens. That's that's some peachy plan. It is. Wow. Well, if uh, I did, did we exhaust? Oh no, you can call us yes. on the telephone. Well, I, I did that? that part, but we didn't do the Facebook dot com slash. No, the, I hear the Facebook, the Tumblr, yeah. the, the 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 Twitter, the Twitter, uh, all of those. I I hose. Yes. I hear of Sherlock. Yes, 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 yes. And of course on Google Plus. Yes. Uh, just bit.ly slash sh community, capital S, capital H, capital C, uh, bit.ly slash sh community. We'll find lots of folks, uh, like minded folks and some unlike minded folks, but that's what makes the world go around, doesn't it, folks? Yes. Um, talking about your favorite subject, which today included lingerie, so I had to get that <laughs> spam out of there. Uh, but other than that, it's mostly about Sherlock Holmes. Go figure. Yeah. Just sort of stunned by the by the mention of the word lingerie. That 
You 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 rarely hear about lingerie in the Sherlockian community. Yes. Although all, all of those although, original references, you know, uh, Watson failed to record. I must say, Holmes, that dressing gown is very becoming. <laughs> well, he was hoping for maybe an undressing gown. <laughs> I've you just given record. Mary an undressing gown for our anniversary. <laughs> I, I must go back to my practice, Holmes. Goodbye. Women on three continents. That's, you know, that's John three continents Watson for mm-hmm. you right there. Yeah. Uh, but of course, that that comes to uh, brings to mind uh, Bob Tomlin, who was on the show way way back. I think it was episode ten and eleven. Mm-hmm. As our guest, he used to run Autumn in Baker Street, mm-hmm. which was informally known as the Great Sherlockian Sleepover. <laughs> and um, if you were going to see lingerie. In a Sherlockian setting, that would be the place. Um, fortunately, I did not, in any of my experience, see it there. But that would be the most likely place. Well, all of that's better left unsaid, I think. Indeed. And better left said is what our guest had to say. Yes. And uh, without so without further ado, or maybe only a little ado, or a little dabble, do you? We can pick up our conversation with... Bert Cools. At this point, we're, we're in 1988. Uh, the Hound was produced. This was a, a two-part dramatization, I take it? It was, yes, two hours. Okay. And it went, it went out on, I think, subsequently, it went on on Sunday afternoons with a repeat on Monday evening. So we got the afternoon okay. weekend audience and the, and the evening listening audience as well, which is, is great. And and what was the public reception like? It was actually very very good. I was I was really pleased. Um, we got some very good uh, very good reviews, very good uh, audience appreciation figures. The BBC has this audience research department that uh, picks up not only on the numbers of people who listen, but on their uh, on their reactions to individual actors, to individual moments. What did you like? What didn't you like? And we got very good AI figures on that. Um, really? Yeah. Um, one thing that pleased me was that one of the reviews uh, said both Holmes and Watson sound amazingly young. Hmm. That there was still out there this feeling that Holmes and Watson were guys in their sort of late fifties, early sixties. Um, you know, we talked about William Gillette. William Gillette was cast in that premiere recording, not only because he was the most famous Sherlock Holmes in the world at that time, but also because he was the epitome of how people saw Holmes. I mean, he was in his seventies. Um, but that was right then. And one of the points I really wanted to make, you, you read it out, I think, Bert, at the end of that uh, character description that I wrote for the Hound. Both men were in their early 30s. Mm. I thought that was a very important point to make. Mm. So, uh, yeah, that's been some of the odd criticism. Well, not a lot of it, but some of the criticism of the BBC Sherlock series. Uh, there were a couple of people who said, well, they're so young. Well, but they were so young. You know, if you look at Holmes' uh, uh, birthday and uh, the dates and so on, Holmes was in his late 20s at that time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Holmes retired in his late 40s. Uh, it, it's an amazing fact. But uh, and it, it's an important fact because it affects their relationship to so many of the other characters in the canon. It affects their relationship to the police, to their clients, particularly to their, their established aristocratic clients. These are two young guys, certainly in a study in Scarlet, as you say, um, late 20s, perhaps even slightly earlier than late 20s. Mm-hmm. And it makes a huge difference. So after you've got the, um, the hound under your, your belt, um, it, is it the natural thought to start attacking the canon from the beginning and, and moving through the entire no, uh, that, set that- of stories? No, that, that, that wasn't a thought at all. Um, I wanted to do a follow-up, and I was very pleased with, with being given that slot, as I said, the classic serial slot, a prestige slot. So I, I looked at the, at the books, and I thought, well, what will work in, the, in the, the classic serial slot? And I thought, well, let's do a study in Scarlet, because I mean, it had been done, but hadn't been done for 10, 12 or more years. Um, and we've got two young guys that'd be perfect for a study in Scarlet. And also, if we get two hours for a study in Scarlet, I could do something that hadn't been done before on, on BBC Radio. Uh, I could do the backstory. I could give a, a mm. decent amount of time. Now, people I know 
don't care on the whole for the backstory for the Mormons and Utah and all the rest of it. I rather like that part of the book. Um, I don't think it's as well written as the Holmes and Watson stuff, and I, and I don't think it's as well it's, – it's not integrated into the story. It comes as a, a huge watch of diversion. But I, I, I thought I could see a way of, of getting around that, of, of making it a part of the, of the whole story. So I, I, I pitched um, a study in Scarlet to David Johnston, and he said, well – Let's go, let's go for broke. Let, let's suggest a study in Scarlet and the next one, and the sign of the four. Um, because it makes a nice package, you know. They meet in a study in Scarlet. They learn to know each other and to like each other. And at the end of the sign of the four, they split up. Watson gets married. He goes away. Holmes is alone. It, it's a nice – it has an arc. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, that's wonderful. Yeah, that, so we pitched that. And – the BBC took its time deciding, which they, they do. And <laughs> word came back, um, yes, you've got them. I mean, uh, it was my turn to be gobsmacked, as we say, all over again. Um, you've got a study in Scarlet, you've got the sign of the four. And I thought, fantastic. And they said, David will be producing, fantastic. And they said, and you have to recast the leads. And both David and I said, What? And they said, you have to recast the leads. We don't like Roger Reese and Crawford Logan. Hmm. And I said, I, mean, I shouldn't have said this, but I said, why don't you? And they quite rightly said, we just don't. We need new actors, please, for the leads. And David said, no, originally. He said, no, um, we've established this oh. team. They're, they're a good team. And the response from the, you know, the high ups, and it was, it, it went very high up beyond just the, the radio drama department, um, was no new actors, no new shows. Wow. So huh. David, David said, you know, well, what should we do? And I said, well, it's frankly, it's too good an opportunity for me to say no to. I mean, I was still at the beginning of my career as a writer. I needed the shows. And so with, with enormous reluctance, I said, Let's recast it. And, and he agreed. And it happened all over again. We sat down and we started making lists. <laughs> and as you was, know, was the was the original selection on your list this time? Uh, our Sherlock? Uh, no. Uh, for for <laughs> some peculiar reason. <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't considered. Um, <laughs> and actually, I, and I'm enormously proud of this. Um Clive Merrison was, was one of my very first suggestions, and he was one of David's as well. Um, Clive, I, I should tell you, is an enormously experienced radio actor, uh, an award winner. In fact, he, he won a, a Sony Award, which is the, the highest radio – they're kind of like the radio Oscars over here. Um, he won that for Best Actor in a Play shortly before we cast him. And – Michael Williams came from a, a new person on the team because David uh, at that time said he started to be unwell and it turned out that he had cancer mm. and he rapidly became a great deal less well, so much so that he wasn't able to direct the shows, which was a, a, a huge blow to him as well as to everybody else. And mm. uh, another director was brought in, a man called Ian Cottrell, uh, another BBC staff director, marvellous director. Um, and he was he would direct the shows, and David would produce them. Now that's that's an unusual combination. Uh, normally in in radio, uh, the producer is also the director. Um, not so much I've always thought an indication of versatility, as an indication of uh, of economy. Uh, the BBC don't have to pay two people to do one person's job. Um, so Ian came in, and and almost the very first thing he said was. I'd like to cast Michael Williams as Watson. And everybody said, what a brilliant idea. Because Michael, I, I, I'm never quite sure how well known our actors are in the U.S. Is, is Michael a known name in the U.S.? Oh, I would say not. Ex- uh, yeah. As Judy Dench's husband, probably more, well, than, well, yes, more, yes, than, yes. more than for his yes, work. Yeah, yes, right. Um, enormously well known over here. I mean, like Clive, a member of the Royal Shakespeare Company, a very distinguished stage actor, um, made a few films, but best known, best known for the stage and also for comedy. And I at first was very slightly apprehensive that, that Ian 
Cottrell wanted to cast him because of his comedic ability. Because one thing I was very firm about when we did The Hound was that I didn't want Watson to be Nigel Bruce. And now Nigel Bruce has many fine qualities, but being Dr. Watson is not one of them for me. <laughs> um, and I very much wanted Watson to be, um, you know, as strong and intelligent and vital and important a character as, as Holmes was in The Hound. I wanted them to be joint leads. It wasn't starring Roger Rees as, as Sherlock Holmes with Crawford Logan as Dr. Watson. It was the two of them together. And that was a, a philosophy that carried right through. And so um, I, I talked to, to Ian about it. He said, no, 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 no. Um, I want him because he's the best possible actor to play this part. He has the integrity. He has the strength. He has the, the romance in his, in his makeup that Watson needs. He can very effectively play Watson the writer which is something else that was very important for me to get across. Watson, as a writer, it, it's very important for the character that Watson is a writer. It's what keeps him, um, it's what keeps him sane, I think, in that relationship. <laughs> the fact that he, could, that he can bring this, uh, this whole mm. aspect to it. Um, so that was the decision. Uh, we contacted Clive Merrison and Michael Williams. They were both available. They both wanted to do it. And we set off into the studio to, to do a study in Scarlet, uh, a, a segment of which you've already played. Mm -hmm. And marvellously, I mean, they did know each other already. They were friends. They'd done a TV sitcom, a very obscure TV sitcom together some years earlier, but they did know each other anyway. Um, and they played the part like two people who've known, uh, once they got into it, they played it like two people who do know and like and respect each other very much. And that's, that's an important aspect of the, uh, mm. of the characters in the playing, particularly in radio when, when, you know, it's all in the voice and everything is focused right down on the vocal performances and, and they just nailed it completely. Mm. Yeah. Well, with the, right. the Watson presence, should we take a listen to the clip from the dancing man? Because, uh, and by all means, yeah. Holmes, this third gunshot, huh? how is it that Mrs. King and Saunders didn't hear it? They did. Mr. Holmes? Uh, Watson, Mrs. King's testimony, if you would. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, here we are. I was woken by an explosion, and you said, an explosion, you mean, you mean a, a gunshot? Well, obviously, that's what it was, sir. But it did seem extremely loud. Carry on, Mrs. King. And then, as I was getting out of bed, there was another one. Another explosion? Uh, well, yes. But she wasn't sure. She wasn't at all, sir. Yeah, thank you, Watson. You see, Inspector. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but I'm still in the dark. Forgive me, but is this the way you always work together? Uh, yes, yes. The important point is exactly what Mrs. King was uncertain about. She could hardly have been in doubt that there was a second, sir. It was the nature of it that made her hesitate. Um, I thought perhaps that one, that's the second one, yeah. was further away. It wasn't further away. It simply wasn't as loud as the first. An explosion followed by an ordinary gunshot. But, of course, it wasn't an explosion. It was two guns going off simultaneously. By George! Well, that explains everything. Gentlemen, I don't know what to say. This is wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Watson as equal partner and essential yeah. uh, essential part of the investigation. And Michael Williams does it brilliantly, doesn't he? You, you can see him opening his notebook and you can tell when he's reading the notes, when he's getting into the performance as the witness and when he's back to being himself again. Yeah. It's very important um, when you've only got sound to, um, to keep the, the characters alive you know, what, what Ted Hardwick can do by standing in the back of a shot and raising an eyebrow uh, needs a line on radio. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And it seemed to me, I mean, we're told in several of the stories that Watson takes notes at the scenes. And so let's have him use the notes. Let's have Holmes and he replay bits of the action um, in order to recreate scenes that we don't need to, to hear in themselves. Yeah, I, I think those effects, as well as uh, even some of the vocal effects that the actors use, the inflection of a voice to show yeah. um, annoyance or satisfaction or, 
you know, a, a dozen other types of emotion that uh, would come across with a simple uh, flick of a wrist or a raised eyebrow or something. It, it, that's, it's a, it takes a, t- a special talent to do that. A, a uh, very special talent, yes. It, it's um, it's a, a real and a definite skill all of its own, just acting with the voice. There's more to it than just saying the words. There's more to it than just acting the words, as, as you say. Mm. I mean, a, a grunt, a smile. You can hear a smile. Yeah. I, I often, as a direction in the script, so I would often put a vocal smile. And the actors yeah. knew exactly what I meant they, by that. They know how to do it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Now, the um, what, what strikes me more than just uh, th- this entire project, bringing the canon to life, which really hadn't been done in totality before, as you mentioned, the, mm-hmm. the Hobbes and Shelley version came within four stories of doing just that. But this was the first time all 60 would be brought to life. To me, and what we talk about frequently on the show... Uh, is is more important is the relationship between Holmes and Watson and the evolution of that relationship over time. Of course, the the first brusque uh, introduction in uh, A Study in Scarlet, all the way through to the end, um, whether you take it chronologically or in the the order they were written, uh, with his last bow or the retired colorman as the final story. You've got this this decades long friendship that evolves over time. And I think Marison and Williams have done an admirable job in their relationship with each other through the stories in showing how that relationship does develop. Yes, yes, I I agree with that. The relationship for me is what's at the core of the stories. They are not primarily for me detective stories. They're Mm -hmm. stories about a detective (laughs) <laughs> which is subtly, I think, not quite the same thing. And more than that, they're, they're stories about a detective and his only friend. Yes. Um, mm. And one of the, the, the great things about, uh, I should say, we've kind of skipped a step, haven't we? Um, we did a study in Scarlet. We did the sign of the four. Um, they went down very well. I proposed, uh, again, to do a, a series of six of the short stories. That's what Just I six? Pitched. Just six. And... Um, I heard nothing, and I continued to hear nothing, and I heard nothing again. And finally, um, it was at a Christmas party at Broadcasting House, the BBC headquarters, and I I bearded the head of radio drama. And I said, what's happened to my my, my suggestion, the six Sherlock Holmes short stories? And he said, oh, we're we're thinking about it, we're thinking about it. And shortly (laughs) after that, I I, I got the phone call, and... um, he says, can you come in for, for a meeting? We, we, we'd like you to come in for a meeting about Sherlock Holmes. And, okay, fine. And so I, I went up to, to London, to Broadcasting House. I walked in, and there was the, the head of radio drama. Uh, there was a, a, a producer called Enid Williams, who was a, one of the senior producers. And there were two other guys who I didn't know. And I was introduced to them. Um, and I went into the room, and there was uh, the head of radio drama. And there was Enid Williams, who was one of the senior producer directors. And there were two other guys who I didn't know. And I was introduced to them. This is Vincent McInerney, and this is Peter Mackey. They're writers. Oh. And I thought, hmm. eh? Um, six episodes, my series, and they're introducing me to two normal writers. What, what the hell is going on? And it was then that I was told, which presumably the others had already been told, uh, we weren't going to do six episodes. We were going to do the lot. We were going to do, for the first time ever, the entire canon, all 56 short stories and the remaining two novels. Um, And the reason there were three of us there was that we were going to do them uh, in book publication order. So we would do the adventures would be the first series and then the, the memoirs and so on. And what happened was the, the head of radio drama had a list of the stories in the adventures, uh, you know, the uh, Scandal Bohemia, whatever comes next, the Red Headed League, Case of Identity. And he went down the list going one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three in the margin. And then he, he produced three <laughs> slips of paper with one, two and three written on them. And he should have had a deer stalker, but he didn't. He had a waste paper basket, <laughs> um, which he dropped the slips of paper into. And we were invited, the three writers, to reach in and pick out a slip. Oh, oh. And whichever number we got, that would be the, the, the stories we were given. Terribly. Oh, and what was your number? My number, thank every god that exists and ever will, my number was number one. <laughs> which meant I got, I got a scandal in Bohemia. But more importantly, it meant 
I was able to set the tone and the style and the approach for the whole series. So I got, what, a Scandinavian Bohemia, uh, the Boscombe Valley Mystery, trying to think, the Blue Carbuncle, and the Noble Bachelor, which not a bad not a bad selection i thought um two really good ones uh and two strong ones but not sort of maybe top rank ones um but i had the scandal behavior which is i desperately wanted and so that was that and then we were sent away to, to write our scripts and all the usual things happened after that another producer yeah. came in a guy called patrick rayner and um the scripts came backwards and forwards, and there was a certain amount of, of evening out had to be done because not all three writers were kind of on the same uh, on the same page when it came to style. Uh, Peter Mackey loved using a lot of narration. I liked using no narration at all, if I could possibly get away with it. Vincent was kind of in the middle. So there, there was a certain amount of evening out and um, script editing that the two directors had to do. But, oh you no, know, it worked, and we went into the studio and we recorded the first series. And it was kind of a success, and then we went on from there, series mm. by series. But you, you mentioned the Blue Carbuncle. Um, yeah. Well, oh, yes. One of the things that was discussed at that meeting was how long should the shows be? I mean, we'd established uh, two-part serials for The Hound of the Basco, the original Hound, and for The Study in Scarlet and The Sign of the Four. Um, but the, the short stories, um, and we were told, well, they would work at 30 minutes, they would work at 45 minutes. What do you think? And before anyone else could say anything, <laughs> I, I shot him, well, it, 45 is much better much better because it gives the stories time to breathe and it, it stops them being just puzzles. You know, one of the things that you could criticise the, the Hobbs and Shelley shows for is that they, they ran for something like 26, 27 minutes and on the, the denser stories, that's only just enough time to get the case in and mm. solved. And because I wanted to make the relationship a core thing, it was wonderful to have breathing space mm. around the mystery. Well, for, but, for an but, example... But on, on of, the, the, I, was, I was just going to interject here for a moment. On the flip side, for those stories that are a bit thin, for those stories that are, are shorter or that don't have... or perhaps have a lot of Watsonian narration, uh, which I, I know you said your preference is to eliminate narration, how does one go about uh, creating something out of whole cloth, inventing scenes that were not even in the canon in order to lead up to the action that we know was in the canon. And I, well, and I know the Blue Carbuncle clip is going to demonstrate some of that. Yes. It, it, let me talk first about a, another story, which, which shows the problem in even more light, I think. Um, in a lot of the stories, the bulk of the story, the plot of the story, actually takes place before the story itself begins. And the classic example of that is The Crooked Man. The Crooked Man begins essentially with Holmes calling on Watson and saying, in effect, something really interesting has been happening over the past week. I'd like you to come in and be in on the end of it. And that's what happens. Watson, as usual, abandons his practice and goes off with Holmes. And we have the end of the story. Now, the two most important people in The Crooked Man, no, I beg your pardon, the three most important people in The Crooked Man are Henry Wood, the crooked man, mm -hmm. the colonel, uh, mm -hmm. and Colonel Barclay, and his wife. Mm -hmm. And of those three, two of them don't appear in the story in person at all. So, one technique <laughs> for filling in the space is to do what I would do with a story like that, which was to sit down and sketch out um, a beat-by-beat -beat synopsis of the story, not as it's written by Conan Doyle, but in terms of the events that actually happen. So the very first beat in The Crooked Man takes place well into the past, uh, during the Battle of, whatever it is, Kandahar, is it? Um, when Henry Wood uh, sets out to do something heroic and is betrayed by the colonel who takes all the credit for it. And that's the key, that, that's what film screenwriters call the inciting incident. That's what sets the story in motion. And I thought, well, okay, that's, that's a good point. Let's have that in. And then I, I sketched out all the subsequent beats. And it's only about halfway through this exercise that you come to Sherlock Holmes calls on Dr. Watson, 
which means that the resulting radio version has quite a good deal of action before we even come to Sherlock Holmes at all. Mm. Now, that's something that you can do, and you can do successfully in a long-running series. I mean, you couldn't do it in perhaps the first episode of a series, mm -hmm. but into, a, into the series, you can do that, because the audience knows it's going to be Sherlock Holmes. The audience knows it's going to be Dr. Watson. They're quite content to say, well, you know, we'll come to them eventually. It'll be interesting to see how they fit in and where they fit in. So that's one way to do it. That's one way to, to, to use material that Conan Doyle mentions but doesn't actually write himself. The other way to do it is to, as you say, to, to expand from your own imagination. At that first meeting, we laid down uh, in discussion a, a whole document of guidelines as to what we could do and what we wouldn't do. And, you know, um, things like Holmes and Watson must still smoke. We must retain Holmes' drug use. We must retain Watson's opposition to it, all the rest of it. Um, but a couple of key points that came up were we must feel free to invent new scenes and even new endings to the stories where mm. the original endings aren't seen to be dramatically as effective as they could be. And that gave us uh, the license, all of the writers, both the original three and, and the subsequent team, that gave us the license to be, as I think it was Patrick Rayner who coined it, he said, what you have to do is be imaginatively faithful. Mm. And I think that's a wonderful phrase. Um, like you that. have to be true to the spirit. You have to be true to the characters. You have to be true to the times, to the um, relationship, to the, the characteristics of, of the way these guys think. Um, you mustn't make them modern characters. These are Victorian men with Victorian attitudes. Um, but within that, be as imaginative as you want to be, as long as it doesn't violate ever the spirit. And so that's what we did. Um, and why don't why don't we take a listen to how that actually worked out in okay. the adventure of the Blue Carbuncle? My apologies for keeping you waiting, Doctor. <laughs> it was worth it to see the expression on Horner's face when he came out. Well done, Holmes. No, no, I mean it. There he was, off back to his family and friends. Did my heart good. I await with interest your heart-wringing prose version. Not really, old man. Can't you let it drop for a second? Well, I must be getting home. It's only been a Christmas Eve to remember. And tomorrow, I dare say, I'll even find the children tolerable. Hello. Good night, then. Watson, Wade. Holmes? Good Lord. I had no idea it was so late. Early. Watson. Holmes, this is damnably rude of me, but... Well, I know you dine very late, as a rule. Absolutely true, Doctor. I am about to tell me that I'm ruining my digestion. Actually, I was, I was wondering if Mrs. Hudson might stretch to providing for two. For two? Oh, Mary would have gone to bed hours ago, the whole household. I realise it's a dreadful imposition. I believe I can tolerate it. Thank you, Holmes. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> Come along, Doctor. Faces to the north and quick march. <laughs> Holmes doesn't want to be alone and can't say so. But Watson knows what he's thinking and allows himself to make the offer to be with Holmes on this, this Christmas Eve Um Everything is surrounded by festivity and family life is very important. And Watson makes it possible for him and Holmes to be together on Christmas Eve, even though it's something that Holmes couldn't ask for. Mm -hmm. It says in the script, I think the, the phrase I used for Holmes was, um, and for once the mask comes off. Mm -hmm. And then 
you get this this and and they both play it so beautifully you you get this this naked moment of emotion between them and then right at the end i think i put and the mask goes back on again and we get you know come on doctor faces to the north that's a lovely moment i think oh it is a lovely moment yeah. and it's lovely for so many reasons and that that um Scene begins with uh, an uncharacteristic testiness of Watson uh, to Holmes' criticism of his of his literary work. Oh, can't can't you drop it just for a moment? Which is which is so beautifully characteristic. In fact, the whole thing, you know, the 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 magic of this when it's really well done is it becomes a scene that you believe for a moment Conan Doyle really did right, but you've just forgotten. Or <laughs> or at its very basis, it's um it's it's certainly what Conan Doyle should have written. I mean it's just so go. it just rings so true. And unfortunately so many of the pastiche work that's done about these characters does not ring true, either in language or in these marvelous moments. And it's a great example of what you mentioned earlier in terms of the breathing space that allows... I mean, if you think about that, you know, those that almost two minutes, you know, you have the stories at the end, but you're still with the characters, and you're yeah. in this breathing yeah. space that makes them very human. I, I, I must say that I, I take as an enormous um, compliment what you just said that I wrote a scene that Conan Doyle should have written is the height of praise for me. Thank you very, very much. Oh, well, it's true. It's true. And then we have another example, too, from um, The Solitary Cyclist, another example of a, of a final scene. And this was from, I think, two years later in 1993 that's, that's not in the story. And let's, let's listen to that, and then you can tell us a little bit about how that came to be. Okay. Do you mean to say that this... The whole business was so that they could get their hands on Miss Smith's inheritance. It was Woodley's plan. And God help me, he persuaded me to be a part of it. It's no sort of excuse, gentlemen, but the picture he painted, the money... One of them was to marry her and the other to have a share of the plunder. Why did Woodley propose to her first, Carruthers? Why not you? We... We played cards for her. He won. How dare you? Oh. Miss Smith, you should be resting. How dare you, sir? Well, Miss Smith, Smith, how much did you hear? Mr. Holmes, is Mr. Carruthers going to jail? It's not for me to prejudge the trial. Yes, I think it very likely. What will happen to Catherine, the little girl? Uh, the court will make some sort of arrangement. Some sort of arrangement. How could you do it? To her. To your own daughter. How could you do it to me? Greed is a terrible thing, but... Miss Smith, it's like a disease. It eats away at you. Changes you completely. I haven't always been the man you see now. Beg you to believe me. I would have been worthy of you once. You beg me to believe you. Every single thing you've told me has been a lie. Except one. I do love you. Did you truly feel nothing for me at all? I was so happy. I don't think I've ever been so happy. Not since my father was... How could you make someone so happy and then just snatch it all away? I wish to God I'd never set eyes on you. Hmm. Marvellous acting, I yeah. think. Um, we should mention, I, I think we haven't done this for the other clips, but Susanna Harker as Violet Smith there and Dennis Quilly as Bob Carruthers. Mm. And, oh, Dennis Quilly. Oh. Dennis Quilly. And, we'll get back to uh, him in a moment. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we will. yes I'll, I'll tell you about Hold Dennis Quilly. Um, but the, the reason, as you say, that scene is not in the story. And my first draft script, which I sent in uh, to Patrick Rayner, the director of this one, uh, finished 
as the story finishes, which is to say that um, the mystery is solved, they go back to the house, uh, Miss Smith has a sort of fit of the Victorian vapours and is sent upstairs to lie down quietly, and Holmes Watson and Carruthers talk out the end of the of the story. And I sent that in, and Patrick Rayner phoned up, and he said, no, 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 that won't do at all. And I said, why not? He said, well, because we've lived through... 40 minutes of Violet, Violet Smith's story. It's her story. She's just the key character. Um, we can't just dispatch her off to the bedroom and let the story finish without her. She's got to confront Carruthers. And I, I thought, fine, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, the two main... It's, it's always a question of who the story is about. I mean, in one sense, they're all about Sherlock Holmes. They're all about Dr. Watson. But in another sense, they're about the client. They're about the villain. In this case, um, Carruthers and, and Violet Smith. So, yeah, um, so I threw away the ending that I'd written, and I thought, well, what would happen? What's the best moment for her to reappear? And obviously, she had to hear the line, we played cards for her, so she could react to that. And then I wrote, and then the strength of it doesn't come necessarily from my writing. It comes from the, the performances. That wonderful confrontation, I think. And it's important to know I, that... Previously in the episode, we've established that she was very attached to her father, that her father died when she was quite young, um, and that she sees Bob Carruthers and his young daughter as mirroring her relationship with her father, which is why oh. it hurts so much that he can do that to his daughter. Um, and thanks entirely to Patrick Rayner, that scene is one of the most powerful scenes, I think, in the whole of that series and possibly in the whole of the canon. And I had some wonderful feedback from listeners about that scene. Mm. So um, thanks to Patrick. <laughs> that and is, that's wonderful. The, the reason it's Bob, it's Dennis Quilly playing Bob Carruthers, I mean, apart from the fact that he's a very fine actor, um, is this. We talked about how to open out the stories, how to find material to fill the space. And Another way of doing that is to look in the story for clues to things that can be used to expand the action. And the clue, the wonderful clue in The Solitary Cyclist, there are two. We find out quite early on that Violet Smith is a pianist and that her father was a musician and she's a very musical person. And there's a throwaway line in the story where she says at one point, um, when before things start to go wrong, she says to, to Holmes, um, oh, I, I'm getting on so well with Mr. Carruthers, I play his accompaniments after dinner. <laughs> now, that means that Carruthers is a musician too, uh, and in an age where most educated men and women had some musical ability, and a musical performance after dinner was a, you know, a standard thing. Um, and so I thought, okay, he's a musician. Now, does he play an instrument? Um does he play the cello or something to contrast with her piano? And then I thought, and I don't know where it came from, but it was a, a lucky thought. I thought, he, he's a singer. Suppose he's a singer. Then I can have scenes in the story where she plays and he sings. And I can have scene interludes of him singing songs that reflect the plot of the story and how things are going. So it, it, I was saying it, it's kind of a, a non-realistic device to have uh, seen interludes of just singing. But um, radio can take that in, in a way that television somehow doesn't always feel able to. Um, somehow if you've just got the, the voice, if you've just got the sounds, it works. So I was able to go through, I had a, a wonderful time trawling through Victorian uh, songbooks and parlour songbooks to find... Uh, to find appropriate songs. So we had songs like The Gypsy's Warning and, uh, as you said, uh, Daisy Bell. Home, home, sweet, sweet home. There's no place like home. There's no place Lady, one 
Once there lived a maiden, pure and bright, and like the fair. But he wooed and wooed and won her, filled her gentle heart with care. And this, this marvellous song by Michael Bell from The Bohemian Girl, uh, When Other Hearts which became a kind of uh, motif song. It's established that it was um, Violet's father's favourite song, and he taught it to her. Yeah. And there's a scene where she teaches it to the, the little girl. And after the scene that we just played, uh, it's not the very end of the show, because we have another non-realistic moment. We hear um, Bob Carruthers sing the song in full for the first time and that's how we go out of the episode with this uh, as the little girl says it's it's a beautiful song it, it's it's happy and sad all at the same time then he heeded not her weeping nor cared he her life to save soon she perished now she's sleeping in the cold and silent grave. That's better. We will have no more violence. Do not turn so coldly from me. I would only guard thy youth from his stern and withering power. I would only tell the truth. And it, it just perfectly fitted the mood. And I wrote it after I had that idea. I wrote it with Dennis Crilly in mind because Dennis Crilly is. is was sadly uh, a, a very noted singer as well as a very noted actor. He um, he created the role of Sweeney Todd in the Sondheim in the West End. Mm. He was England's first Sweeney Todd, and incredibly. Well, of course, he, our our listeners would uh, perhaps know Dennis Quilly uh, as a num a, 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 in addition to a number of other actors in in the series of actors who also played characters in the Granada. Sherlock Absolutely. Holmes. He's, um, he's the, the big game hunter, Leon Sterndale. Mm, that's correct. The, the, the lion's mane, yeah. And, and your Leon Sterndale in the BBC series was played by Patrick Allen, who that's also played Colonel Moran in right. uh, the Granada it's, series. It's a small Sherlockian world. <laughs> uh, there is, and there are a couple of others there. I'd be interested to see if any of our listeners could come up with uh, at least two other crossovers that we've been able to find uh -huh. Between main characters in the BBC radio series and main characters in the Granada series, I think we'll offer a uh, a free copy of Bert's book oh. to to uh, the first listener who can give us either one of the two names that we're thinking of of those crossover actors. Very good, excellent. That's very generous. Be interesting to see what people come up with. Indeed. Indeed. So uh, speaking about casting for a moment, uh, there were some other inspired casting choices for some other uh, minor parts in some of the series. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Peter Salas. Tell us a little <sighs> bit about Peter Salas and the role he played. Well, Peter Salas, um, I, I think, must be well known to, to American TV audiences as, uh, as Norman Clegg in uh, Last of the Summer Wine. Oh, I think or, he's. I think he's as, more. Yes, more known as uh, the voice of uh, Wallace in Wallace, of Wallace and Gromit. Yes, in, in Wallace, 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 Wallace and Gromit. Yes. yes, of course. Yes. Okay. But um, little, little known. Um, he had his first. Um, let's see. Am I right about that? Yeah, he had his first connection with Holmes, 1964 or so, as Watson in. Um, Baker Street with Fritz Weaver, didn't he? Oh, yes. that's right. Yeah. Now, that's now, right. Peter Salis maintained uh, and continues to maintain, as far as I know, that he got that part by accident. <laughs> and the, the producers thought they were casting Peter Sellers. <laughs> now, I've I, don't, no, I've no I don't idea. know about that's that. That's funny. I've no idea if that's a joke. I, it's, a very, it's a very good joke. It is a, a joke. very good joke. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he's a very modest and self-deprecating man. Um, but, yes, he um, he was – 
very well known over here in the last of the summer wine where he plays this rather gentle pensioner um with mm-hmm. two, two other pensioner friends who who really do nothing in the episodes but wander around chatting um and as you say as wallace the, the lovely gentle inventor and rather mm-hmm. naive character and Enid williams who who was a friend of his um cast him as jonas oldacre in in and i will think of the title Builder. thank you very much <laughs> in the norwood builder um and it was brilliant casting because I mean, this is a, this is a massive spoiler if people don't know the story. But you know, unfortunately, we can't get round it. I don't think Jonas Oldacre <laughs> is the villain of the Norwood Builder, um, appearing at first as a perfectly nice, reasonable, respectable uh, builder from Norwood, surprisingly, um, but turning out to be a really very, very nasty piece of work indeed. Mm. And casting Peter Salis, lovely, gentle, mild Peter Salis, as a very nasty piece of work indeed, but it's a masterstroke of casting. So bravo to Enid for that. Yeah. <laughs> and in addition to uh, to Peter Salis, um, Desmond Llewellyn ah, appeared yes. a couple of times. Once his banister. In what would our students. audience know? Yeah, oh, in the three yes. students, correctly. <laughs> What would the audience know Desmond Llewellyn from in popular culture? De- Desmond uh, Llewellyn, the, the, the first and I think the finest Q yes. in the James Bond movies. How did you um, get him? Um, funnily enough, some, someone asked that question at Indiana. How do you get these marvelous stars? And, and the answer, prosaically, is, you know, we ask them and they say yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, actors in England... Act, I'm sorry, actors in the UK like doing radio. Mm. You know, for, for all its intensity and its concentration, it's a very, very popular genre for actors to do. We don't have, I, I think it's changing now in the US, but my impression is um, that up until recently, the acting profession in the US tended to be very compartmentalized. I think you, you maybe had stage actors and film actors and TV actors. And I, it, it's melding together now. Am I, am I right in thinking that? But th- there was. A t- I think that's correct. Yeah, a lot of lot of voice, quote unquote, voice actors coming yep. through now are actually mainstream Hollywood stars. And yep. frankly, I think the voice actor community resents that a little bit because <laughs> they felt like this was their territory. This was the uh-huh. the area that they mined and and made their craft. And now, simply a big name can drop by simply because they're a big name mm-hmm. and scoop up some of their. Uh, their work. I, I can understand that. But over here, it's never been compartmentalized like that. I mean, right back to the earliest days of, of radio, I've witnessed Sir Cedric Hardwick in The Speckled mm-hmm. Man, a very big name on the stage, a very big name in movies uh, on both, both sides of the Atlantic. Our actors like doing radio um, for various reasons. I mean, certainly not for the money. <laughs> they, they, they get paid <laughs> remarkably little by the parsimonious BBC. Um, but on the whole, it means a couple of days um, working with, generally speaking, with friends in a, a relaxed atmosphere, even though it is so intense. It, it's relaxed. It's a happy atmosphere. They get to play parts that they couldn't, generally speaking, play in any other medium, mm-hmm. uh, either because it, of typecasting in other parts or because they're not physically suited or whatever, or because they're too big a name. Um, I mean... Desmond Llewellyn, relatively small parts in his two plays for us. Um, and because of Q in, in the Bond films, he, he was quite a big name. I mean, he could have commanded mm. quite a decent fee, TV or movie. But for us, he comes in happily to, to spend his day in the studio, chat to old friends, do his bit at the microphone and, and go home having enjoyed, you know, a fun time. And that's, that's, that's true of, of all our actors, um, everyone. I don't think anyone ever turned us down. I can, wow. oh, that's not true. I can think of one actor <laughs> who turned us down, and I better call him Al Moriarty, <laughs> 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 because um, he was approached. And actually, to be fair, I don't know. Maybe he wasn't available, but the, I know he he was approached, and he said no for whatever reason. Um, and we ended up with a marvelous Moriarty anyway. So uh, yeah, Michael, to him. Uh, Michael, Michael Pennington, Michael Pennington right? him, right. himself a Holmes. Mm, um, that's right. From I'm sorry, 1987. I've given away one of the... No, I haven't. No, I, no, no, he, that's he, right. He, he wasn't in the, the Granada series. Not in Granada. Um, no. Um, so so yes. of all of the guest stars that you had on the series, who was your favorite and why? Oh, heavens help us. That's a terrible question to ask. I know. It's like asking your um, favorite 
favorite child or fa- no, even no, favorite no. episode. Um, right? I enjoyed with wor- working with all of our guest stars. I was lucky enough to work with with marvelous guest stars, both in the in in the canon dramatizations and in the later further adventures, which we haven't mentioned at all yet. Um, <sighs> That's very diplomatic of you, but give us a story now. <laughs> oh, um, in the canon, Brian Blessed. Brian ah. Blessed is, that, oh, is, he, is he known in America? Oh, sure. Yeah, oh, great. sure he is. Yeah. Brian Blessed pl- played two parts for us. He played Jonathan Small in The Sign of the Four, and he played Henry Wood in The Crooked Man. Um, and after that, um, a policy was – not because of him <laughs> – a policy was instituted where guest stars wouldn't be asked to return. You know, they, they would have their, their one persona in the series, and that was it. <laughs> but he – Blessed is, is – kind of stereotyped in this country as a loud, shouty, <laughs> unsubtle actor. I mean, if you've seen him as Prince Voltan in um, Flash Gordon, the movie, yeah. um, you'll know what I mean. Um, yeah. But in fact, he's the very... He can do that, and he can do it brilliantly, but Blessed, when he wants to be, is a very subtle actor indeed. Mm. And he, both his performances are very subtle. Um his Jonathan Small is a wonderful, understated, outsider performance. And, of course, his, his Henry Wood is also an outsider performance, so slightly less understated because he, he took literally my, uh, my stage direction that his, his whole body, including his face and mouth, were distorted by his, uh, oh. his torture. And so he um, – one review, <laughs> rather unkindly, I thought, described him as sounding like a Bangladeshi Bob Dylan. Oh. I'm not entirely sure what a Bangladeshi Bob Dylan sounds like, but uh, that's to malign what I think was a very fine performance. <laughs> so, yeah, he, in, in the canon stories, he stands out. In, in the Further Adventures, again, a, a wonderful range of actors, but Tom Baker was mm. the standout for me, um, playing a particular part. Um, and brilliantly and beautifully. And again, he has a reputation for being big and over the top, and he was anything but... In this particular story, he was wonderfully contained and focused and a delight to work with. They're, they're all delights to work with. Yeah. We, actors have a reputation for temperament and awkwardness, and in some actors, it, it's a deserved reputation. But radio, because of the demands of radio, because of the time limitations, because of the intensity of the work, temperament hardly ever rears itself. Uh, because of the equality of it, because guest stars in a radio show will happily, nine times out of ten, join in with a crowd scene because it's fun and because they don't consider it beneath them to to join in with everybody else and sort of uh, mutter nonsense in the background because we need a crowd. Um, No temperament. I never encountered in the Sherlock Holmes series any thing approaching temperament or you can't do that with me, I'm a star, or anything like that at all. That's wonderful. So the, um, the, the, the canon proper wrapped up in 1998. Was that when you finished the recording? Um, yes, it was, with, with, um, okay. with a, a second version of The Hound of the Baskervilles. That was the big finale. Ah, nice. So, we, so that was all 60 stories and complete under the same cast, the was. same principal cast at least. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, yes, we had to we had to break the the rules slightly for uh, the smaller parts. We had, I think, three Mrs. Hudsons over the course of it. We had two Inspector Lestrades, purely because Donald G, who was who established Inspector Lestrade, again he he was he was given a movie. He was offered a movie ah. in between series, and he just wasn't available. And we couldn't we couldn't say to him, no, you, you've got to ditch your movie halfway through filming, <laughs> come back and be Inspector Lestrade, please. So we we had to recast Lestrade, but uh, on the whole. We, we managed pretty well. We managed pretty well. And then, uh, sadly, in early 2001, uh, Michael Williams passed away after a long battle with cancer. Um, but you were commissioned then to continue the series even after the canon was depleted. I, I, was, I was commissioned before that, actually. Uh, before, Michael, okay. But yeah, I mean, I, I started writing what became known as The Further Adventures, Um before Michael's illness really took hold. And it was confidently expected that, that he and, and Clive w- would star in, in the series of five pastiches I was commissioned to write. And 
I, I finished writing them and the scripts went in and we did the usual backwards and forwards with the producer. Patrick Rayner directed all of the Further Adventures himself. Um, and I did my rewrites and he suggested bits and I suggested bits. And we were all ready to go. The studios were booked and the guest stars were, were booked for the first series. And then word came through that Michael was unwell. And we didn't know then just how unwell he was. And the hope was that um, that he would still be able to play it. Uh, the whole thing was put on hold. The BBC were wonderful. They said, okay, fine. Um, he's not well. We'll just wait until he is well. And the whole thing was, was, was frozen. Um, and sadly, of course, it never happened. He did get worse and he did, uh, he did pass away. And then uh, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know whether uh, they would recast or whether they would say, no, okay, we'll write off the scripts uh, because we don't want to... Uh, to put someone else in the role. And it took a long time for that decision to be made. I think it took a year at least for them to, to decide that we would recast. And so what happened then was um, Patrick and I sat down again and we started making lists. <laughs> Who can be Watson? Who can be Watson? And in fact, Clive turned up on the internet on a, a forum uh, run by a, a, an American magazine called Scarlet Street, um, which was a, a, a genre magazine. Uh, mm -hmm. who had a, a, a very active forum still going with a, with a Sherlock Holmes section. And Clive, to everyone's amazement, we were discussing the, the shows on there. He turned up one day and he said, well, who, who do you think should replace dear Michael? I mean, who can we get? And a few suggestions were made, some of them rather odd. Uh, <laughs> someone suggested, <laughs> do you have Are You Being Served in America? We do. Yes, yes. Uh, the sitcom, very broad sitcom set in a department store. Yes. Someone suggested John Inman, who plays Mr. Humphreys, <laughs> in that, as, as the I'm idea. I'm free. Yeah, absolutely. I, are you available, Watson? I'm free, Holmes. Um, someone, in all seriousness, I think, suggested John Inman, um, who wasn't really a serious contender, I have to say. Um, but uh, names were exchanged and, and thoughts were thought, and we finished up with an actor also uh, primarily known for comedy, um, an actor called Andrew Sachs, oh, best yeah. known, I, I think, probably on both sides of the Atlantic as Manuel the Spanish waiter in 40 <laughs> Towers. Um, Andrew Sachs, who is a much more versatile actor than that one part would suggest, and who, in fact, had already appeared in the shows. He played the King of Bohemia in A Scandal in Bohemia for us. Um, playing, you know, six foot six and built like Hercules, when in fact he's sort of five foot next to nothing and <laughs> very slight. But he was our new Watson and he stepped into the role magnificently. And uh, the further adventures were a go again. That's wonderful. And and you ended up doing four series. I ended uh, up doing just... four series, 16 episodes all told, yeah. Wow. You you, you mentioned, um, you know, Michael Williams and, and, and his, um, obviously his passing and everything, but um, tell us a little bit about um, how he and Marison together, by the by, the end of the series or toward the end of the series, how they were uh, perhaps a little more free and easy, and and how that may have actually uh, been been uh, demonstrated in some of the recordings. Okay, right. Well, one of the great things about being there at the recordings and being with the actors, uh, both during the recording of the scenes and, and sort of over lunch and stuff like that and in the green room, is that I'd had several years of listening to Clive and Michael just sort of bantering between each other, just swapping stories and mock insults and, you know, uh, just, just generally chatting. And I can remember vividly thinking, that's such a wonderful relationship. I, I, I'd like to get Holmes and Watson to the point where they can have that kind of relationship. Where can I do it? And one of the stories I was given in a later series was The Lion's Mane. Now, The Lion's Mane is, I think it's fair to say, is, is a pretty weak story. It's, it's a late entry story. It's narrated by Holmes in a voice that isn't really Holmes's voice. It mm. doesn't have Watson in it. It's not a strong mystery. And I looked at it and I thought, what on earth can I do with this? And the first thing I decided was, well, it's got to have Watson. I mean, by that stage, it was so firmly established that Holmes and Watson were the joint leads of the show. They were equally important. They each played their own vital, contrasting but complementary parts. So, OK, Watson goes in. And then I thought, well, it would be fun if I could put Watson in and take everybody else out and just have 
45 minutes of just Holmes and Watson talking to each other. And then I thought, well, okay, nice idea. Um, how on earth can I do it? And I looked at the story, and it was exactly the same as I said with the solitary cyclist. There's always a clue in the story if you can find it. And the clue in the lion's mane is that Holmes, at the beginning, says something like, um, the good Dr. Watson had passed beyond my ken in my retirement. The odd weekend visit was all I ever saw of him. And I thought, bingo, that's it. Watson comes on a weekend visit to Holmes, um, and they chat and they catch up with each other. And then Holmes drops this bombshell. You should have been here last week because something really interesting happened. Um, and Watson says, what, um, one of your bees escaped, did they? And Holmes says, no, 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 there was a murder. And Watson says, my God, there was a murder? And Holmes says, yes. Um, and Holmes proposes as a kind of game to make Watson's visit interesting, that he should take Watson around to all the scenes in the story and fill him in on what happened every time and see if Watson could solve the mystery. And so that's what they do. They, they go off to the, the rock pool and the little village and the, you know, the, the, the building where the, uh, the other characters live, the house in the village, and uh, Holmes plays the parts for Watson. He becomes uh, the girl, he becomes the, uh, the teacher, he becomes the mysterious farmer. Um, and Watson gets fed the clues exactly as Holmes was fed them, as they happen. And Watson, of course, eventually does solve the mystery, and it's his great moment in the spotlight. And it was such a pleasure to be able to do that for Michael, and, and to give, I mean, it's essentially, it, it, it's Watson's story. It's Watson's episode rather than mm. Holmes. Um, and I think you've got a clip which, which perhaps illustrates that. Thank you for those Strand magazines, by the way. Oh, you got them good. Um, what did you think of the stories? My housekeeper loved them. And you, of course, never gave them a glance. No time, I'm afraid. No, no. Do you know, I'm busier now than I ever was before. Is that a fact? Oh, yeah. We're not jealous of you at Scotland Yard. No, sir. We're very proud of you. And if you come down tomorrow, there's not a man from the oldest inspector to the youngest constable who wouldn't be glad to shake you by the hand. Yes, I thought you'd like that bit. Sorry you were too busy to read it. Oh, <laughs> oh uh, yes, and while we're on the subject... Mm, go on. In the empty house, yes. about when I was in Tibet, you say I spent some time with the head lama. Oh, that's what you told me. One L. I beg your pardon? You should only have one L. L-A-M-A. -A, one L. You spelt it with two. I did nothing of the sort. Well, if not you, the, the typesetter at the Strand. Oh, dear. You're familiar with the word. Enough to know that it's not exactly appropriate. An animal, isn't it? Hmm. Sort of mountain goat. Popular for its skin and its milk and given to congregating in small herds. I don't believe they have heads. Of course they have heads. Not in the hierarchical sense, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, now that, 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 that's a long-standing Sherlockian joke you well, it, uh, you managed to work into the show. It, exactly. I mean, I, I did do that on occasion. It's a bit naughty, but uh, yeah, a, a little a little gag for the for the uh, the knowledgeable audience. Thank you for paying attention. That's that's yeah. that's great. That, that's probably my freest of all the the canonical dramatizations. That um, uh, there's a scene just before that where, where Watson tells Holmes that he's just been to see William Gillette on, on stage playing Sherlock Holmes. And Holmes gets very jealous about, uh, you know, does he do me well? Is he, is he right? And then they actually act out a little scene from the play. Um, and then Holmes discovers that the end of the play is his, his character falling in love with the girl. Yeah. And uh, he, he takes it remarkably well. Watson is, is a bit embarrassed by to have to report this, but Holmes takes it pretty well. And, and then they... So it kind of sets the... Uh, the, the, the sub-theme of the episode, which, if I can be that pretentious, which is about playing parts and, and uh, pretense. And so we go off into the mystery with Holmes playing all the parts and Watson, if you like, playing the part of the detective. Mm. I was very pleased with that episode. It really I was, well. Yeah. yeah, it does. So 16 episodes, that's, uh, that's a nice round uh, number for the full series there. Um, why don't you take us to the point where you basically put a fork in it uh, that, that you, you, you've stated in, in no uncertain terms to the BBC that this will be uh, the final uh, episode. How, how does one go about that, and how does one make make it final without sending Holmes over the edge of the Reichenbach Falls? <laughs> well, actually, it was it was kind of the other way around. Um, the BBC 
made it fairly clear to us and certainly to me ah. that um, that they didn't want any more. <laughs> um, it, 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 it worked out curiously. I mean, the reason there are 16 episodes is that when they're released on CD, which they, they all have been now, um, they're released in, in packs of four CDs to a pack. So four adventures, if you like, to a, to a box set. Um, and in fact, the, the series went, there were five episodes in the first series, five in the second, um, four in the third, and two episodes in the fourth series, uh, which was a, a two-parter. Um, and it was arranged that way so that we'd end up with an, an even number of divisible by four. And uh, once I, I got the, the hint, and they never actually said it's got to end. They, they, they kind of said, um, maybe, it's, maybe it's had its day, maybe we've, we've enjoyed it for long enough. <laughs> um, but it, it, was, it was in the air that they didn't want any more. And I was, I was wary too. I, I didn't want to start repeating myself. I, I thought 16 episodes was probably a, a good round figure, a, a nice accomplishment. Um, and I had this horror of, of getting stale with it. Um, of starting to run short of plots. I, I was certainly able to understand Conan Doyle's own stance that he, he told, I think, Bertram Fletcher Robinson around the time of The Hound, um, the characters I can do, it's the plots that are the killer. And, yeah. and it's true. I mean, you do, inevitably, you start to think, oh, no, I've done that. I've done that. I can't do that again. And I didn't want that to happen. So when it became clear that we needed two more episodes to, to round the whole thing off. I thought, okay, well, let, let's do it in style. Let's have a two-part episode, uh, a 90-minute story, in effect. I can be a bit more expansive with it. I can, uh, I can do uh, more character development. I, I can be, I can, I can make it, I can give it a bit less pace. I can let it sort of develop at its own rate. And I should say that the, the, the basic approach to the, the further adventures was to take the, uh, the unrecorded cases, um, you know, the ones that are mentioned as throwaways. That of course. I, I, I loved the image of Doyle sort of dropping them in, you know, I mean, the, yeah. the, the, the bogus laundry affair and all the rest of it. Um, <laughs> you could picture him sort of smiling as he writes it, thinking, well, that's one I'll never have to write, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so I, I took on, and I decided at the very beginning that there were two that I wouldn't attempt because the, the, the titles were so strong that I didn't see how I could possibly come up with, with stories to match them. And one, inevitably, was The, the Giant Rat of Sumatra, uh, which is such a wonderful title. I mean, how, how could I possibly write a giant Rat of Sumatra adventure that lives up to the, the sheer promise of the title? Right. Um, and the other was, was the, the case of The Politician, The Lighthouse, and The Trained Cormorant. And when we came to the end, the, the two-parter, I, I briefly thought about the giant rat and I couldn't see a way to do it. And, and suddenly I saw a way of doing the politician, the lighthouse and the trained cormorant and a way of doing it without, I think, shoehorning any of those three elements in, um, you know, as an act of desperation. <laughs> I like to think that all of them are there because they need to be there for the story. And, and so it became the Marlborn Point mystery. Um, and because a politician was involved, it meant I could bring in Mycroft, uh, wow. which was a, a nice way of, of sort of bringing the family back together, you know, for the end. Mm -hmm. um, and that was it. it, it it's the story, basically, of, uh, as Mycroft says to Holmes, it's the story of a suicide and a murder. And Holmes says, well, what's so unique about this particular suicide and this particular murder? And Mycroft says, well, they both involve the same victim. Um, which I thought was quite a nice little hook, you know, to, to bring them in. And all the way through, all the way through this project, from the very first episode, one of my favourite things to write and to hear and, and to see being recorded are the final scenes where the mystery is solved and we go back to Baker Street and they sit down and they have a drink and they have a smoke and they mull over the case and sometimes, you know, Watson says, well, Maybe there's one thing I don't quite get, and Holmes explains it. Lovely. I love those closing scenes. And so I wanted to finish the Marlborn Point mystery with one of those. And I wanted to take it just a little bit further than just that and bring down the curtain on the whole project. And by the time of the Marlborn Point mystery, 
I've been involved with Holmes and Watson for just over 25 years, which is a huge slice of, well, it's a huge slice of my life, never mind a yeah. huge slice of my professional life. And so I, I, I desperately wanted to, to finish it fittingly and in a, in a, I, I don't want to use the word iconic, but in a way that, that would round it off um, satisfyingly and be dramatically satisfying and satisfying for the characters and for the actors as well. And uh, this is what I did. Would you mind? Oh, not in the least. Thank you. You played that for me just a few days after we first moved in here. Did I? I didn't have the least idea what to make of you. Have you now? Oh, I think so, yes. Maybe. You know, I love these moments. The case is solved, everything's over, we're back here in the warmth and comfort. Until the next client comes along. <laughs> and then off we'll go again. I wish it could always be like this. Watson. It will. How can it? Nothing lasts forever. It will because of you. Because of your stories. Don't you see? It doesn't matter what happens here in the real world. We're more than reality, you and I. You, my friend, have made us immortal. That's quite a thought. It's the truth. As long as there are mysteries and murders... And fog and fear... And terror and injustice... I'm Sherlock Holmes, private consulting detective. And John H. Watson, chronicler, comrade and friend... We'll be ready... Waiting for the dramatic ring at the doorbell. <laughs> 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 the, the game's, game's a foot. Wow. And, and, and Bert, I think you've done an admirable job of making Holmes and Watson immortal in your own way. Well, that's extremely kind of you. Thank you very much. Mm. Well, it's true. You know, you've, you've um, created a vast oral landscape, so many additional dimensions. And it's a grand echo, isn't it, of uh, here dwell together still two men of note who never lived and so can never die. Yes. I, I must say okay. I didn't do it alone. I mean, incredible thanks obviously go to everyone who was involved, particularly the technical people, the, the unsung heroes of all this, who, uh, you know, we've, we've praised the sound design, we've, we've talked about the power of the, uh, of, of the atmospheric quality of the scenes, and most of it, a lot, an awful lot of it, is, is down to those sound guys working uh, quickly and with minimal rehearsal, and sometimes with, um, with limited resources, and they do marvels, they work absolute marvels. Thanks to them and the directors and the producers and, of course, the casts and the other writers. Certainly, certainly. So now that uh, the canon and beyond is concluded, what's next for you, Bert Cools? Well, um, I have a, a Sherlock Holmes stage play uh, nice. doing the rounds of theatre companies at the moment. No one has, uh, no one's bought it yet, but uh, with luck someone might. That would be nice. That's, uh, that's based on... Uh, the Lion's Mane, and uh, a similar episode, uh, The Further Adventures, which I did, uh, called The Abbey of Any Murder, which is another two-hander for Holmes and Watson. So it's essentially a, a two-hander stage play. And um, I'm still trying, and I, I still have hopes, to sell a, a Victorian-era set Holmes and Watson TV series. Um, mm. It's very, very difficult at the moment, obviously, because Sherlock is so huge, and elementary is is so big, um, and I love them both. I, I love I love Sherlock. I think it's a wonderful show, and I, I enjoy Elementary. But there are things in Sherlock Holmes 
and his world that I don't get even from Sherlock. I mean, the relationship is wonderful, it's spot on, it's brilliant. But I miss the fog and the gaslight and the cobbles and the handsome cabs and the, and the feel of a world on the brink of modernity. And the wonderful feel of, of Holmes as a scientific pioneer, uh, of a man who's not only better at solving crimes than anybody else, but who is better in a totally different and new way of solving crimes than anybody else. Mm -hmm. so a man who's inventing forensic science as he goes along, almost. And that's a wonderful aspect of the character. And for all its enormous virtues, Sherlock can't give you that. Uh, and I want to see that. I, I want to see a study in Scarlet with the two guys in their late 20s and meeting for the first time and Watson falling in love and getting married. I, I want to see all of that. Mm. But um, who knows if I ever will. But, you know, if anyone's listening with, with a fortune and a TV network at their disposal, uh, please get in touch. Or, or either <laughs> one. You know, you have to start somewhere. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, well, thank you so much for this uh, just magnificent uh, survey of a wonderful landscape. Well, thank you so much. It's a, a real pleasure to have uh, been here chatting with you. Well, you know, Bert said he could keep going on for hours, and um, I believe him. Uh, There's so much to cover in this space, and um, I, I could go on listening for hours. Oh, as well. I could, too. I could, too. I could do another two hours in a heartbeat. And the clips are wonderful, because when you listen to yeah. this series of clips, you can see the evolution of the art, you know, the, the evolution of sound design, the sense of place, the, the power of the individual performances. And it was I was fascinated to hear his comments about the building of sets that the actors, um, you know, at the, yeah, there is actually sets. staging and sequence. And he's absolutely right. I mean, when you're close to someone, you're speaking completely differently than if you were uh, uh, on the other side of a table. And, and yeah. uh, with the higher quality audio fidelity, you need to be able to capture those moments. Yeah. And if you'd like to get a copy of those BBC recordings, the uh, I think it's a... Uh, Oh, 16 volume set. Uh, it's 64, I think it's 64 uh, CDs in total. Um, the whole canon in one dramatization, one, one team dramatization. It is available on Amazon, and we will have the link up in uh, the show notes to this episode. So feel free to check that out. It's provided me with hours and hours of uh, just great listening pleasure. And, and as Bert said, uh, our Bert, that is, to hear the evolution <laughs> of the sound design, to hear uh, how the sets are actually constructed, to hear them uh, getting closer to and farther away from the microphones, uh, and, of course, to hear the evolution of the relationship between Holmes and Watson over time. Just, I don't think it gets any better than this production. No, and, and you know, we really do owe Bert the whole Sherlockian community, I think, goes bird a tip of the hat there for things, um, you know, a very good example of which is that very last clip from the Marlborn, Marlborn Point mystery with Clive Merrison and Andrew Sachs, where he so beautifully captures the eternal nature of these characters. It's uh, just beautiful work. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got a link to that and, of course, to Bert's site, and many others up in the show notes. Excellent. Well, our sponsors have been standing by here very patiently while we and Bert have blathered on. Well, I shouldn't say that Bert has blathered on, but while you and I have, uh, why don't we pay them some due? I am I am the blathering Bert. Yes, and you can blather over to the BakerStreetJournal.com. You know, there's a nip of fall in the air, and what better time to begin thinking now yeah. about how you will spend those long winter evenings by the fire. I can see the flames nipping up through your chimney piece. I can see you cuddled close as the winds howl. I see a snifter of brandy, but wait, what's that on the table? Why, it's the Baker Street Journal. 
the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship and the perfect accompaniment for these long winter nights. That sounds so cozy. Yeah. You know, if that were my scene, uh, it would have been me falling asleep, spilling the brandy all over the glass, <laughs> setting my slippers on fire by the fireplace. It would have been a much different scene. Yeah. Uh, but you know what, folks? The, the Baker Street Journal and the Baker Street Irregulars have a new publication available. You're kidding. Sherlockian Saturdays at the Pratt. Uh, edited and introduced by William Hyder. You know, Bill's a long-time yeah. Baker Street Irregular and member of the Six Napoleons. Um, but, of course, the uh, Napoleons came together with uh, Watson's Tin Box, I believe, and have put on uh, Saturday afternoons at the Pratt Library uh, for many, many years. I think it was established in 1980 and um, 35 years. Uh, oh, it's Six Napoleons of Baltimore and the Carlton Club that have done it. Uh, 35 years later, uh, they have a tremendous amount of scholarship that they've collected from yeah. those papers that have been presented at the Pratt Library on those Saturdays. It's, so. a, it's a wonderful publication. I was very embarrassed when I first heard about it because I thought the title had the words on your in it rather than at the. And I was originally puzzled as to how many Sherlockians could be completely idle and sitting on Saturday nights. But uh, <laughs> uh, I was corrected. And since then, I've looked at it, and it is absolutely fascinating. Yes. So so prattle on, folks. Mm. Oh, that's my job. Oh, well, then uh, then toddle over <laughs> to BakerStreetJournal.com. Check that and all those great things out. Yes, and toddle over to WessExpress.com. Yes. Now, oh, you know, they've got a new publication as well. Of course, in the last episode, as in this one, we will, of course, mention uh, Burt Cool's 221 BBC, the expanded, uh, revised, and updated edition of his tales with uh, BBC Radio. But there is also uh, Sherlock Holmes and the Drury Lane Mystery. Have you heard of this? No, uh, I have heard of it, and but I don't remember who wrote it. It's written by none other than Dennis Hoey. You remember Dennis Hoey? Oh, of course. Inspector That's right. In Lestrade. fact, we I don't did we talk about this with Michael or did I talk about this with Michael? But, you may have talked about it. Yeah, I did. I had I I he came to New York after we had him on the show and I had lunch with him. That and would do it. uh we were talking about this and about um uh, having it see the light of day. And I uh, strongly suggested that he uh, go over to our pals at the Wessex Press, and I'm thrilled that it has uh, that it has seen the light of day. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you should at least get a complimentary copy for suggesting <laughs> that eventuality. You know, I find that I am almost um, unique in being alone at the large number of times I think I'm entitled to complimentary copies of things, and apparently no one else is. <laughs> so, so I well, will you just... need to start a podcast. I should start a podcast, but, you know, I, for, I pop in at car dealers. They're not interested, and it just goes downhill from there. But you, but, might, you might try your luck at the neighborhood bar. Uh, <laughs> yes. It doesn't go much more downhill than that. Uh, no, no. Well, you'll find me there in an evening, me in my tip jar, <laughs> singing old Sinatra songs while no one listens. But uh, the, the, this particular um, mystery was written by Dennis Hoey, who played Inspector Lestrade in the Universal series. And uh, I shall get a copy of it. Please do. And, of course, we have another sponsor. Friends, our pets depend upon us to help them stay healthy and spry. That's why you need Sherlock Holmes brand Baskerville Hound Chow. It's the only hound chow that comes in three proven flavors, Old Shoe, Convict, and Canadian. And it's the only hound chow that delivers the three C's, crushing, chomping, and chewing. chewing. Remember, don't be scrimpin', buy grimpin'. The next time you sneak up on an inheritance by Baskerville Hound Chow, it's at your dealers today. Ha. Always a pleasure for those Sherlock Holmes <laughs> branded items and, and, and their associated uh, brand extensions to come in. Yes. 
I wonder what they'll come up with next, Bert. They're, they seem to be just uh, unstoppable, the creative people of, uh, of the, the Sherlock Holmes brand enterprise, and they do not need approval from the uh, Supreme <laughs> Court, apparently, to, to wow. continue their good work. Sounds like it's time for the news. Yes. I think we can even fade the news out a little bit because it does go on for about half an hour. That's, a, that's more than we have news. <laughs> that's right. Ah, but there's plenty of news, including the Conan Doyle estates going back to the U.S. Supreme Court to see oh. if um, Justice, yes, Justice Sotomayor or any of the other justices, Justice Alito, might um, be au courant with what uh, the dog did in the nighttime? Will they never learn? Uh, well, yeah. Well, probably not. No, they'll, they'll learn this time, the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why... We haven't heard the the uh, the response, has, have we? Probably not. No, I, I don't know if we will. I think it, it's a matter of whether the... Uh, whether the court decides to take it up or not, mm. and then, if so, then when? Mm. And then. So stay tuned for that one. Tish says Justice Ginsburg. Tosh says Justice Alito. <laughs> if only they could be that uh, that contained in mm. their remarks. We'll see. Mm. We'll see. Um, but, of course, we have uh, other activities going on. Um, You've heard by now of the Ian McKellen vehicle uh, starring as a 93-year-old Sherlock Holmes in retirement in Mr. Holmes, the Mm. film uh, adaptation of A Slight Trick of the Mind. Uh, Well, they have actually gotten themselves a U.S. distributor. Yes, Miramax, the Weinstein. Oh, no, How about that? Is Miramax Weinstein again, or is that Disney now? No, oh, that's a good question. No, Weinstein is the Weinstein. I don't remember. Did they buy back Miramax? I don't remember. They may have bought the name back. Mm. I'm not sure. But, but in any case, way, it's a great a major studio. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, either the Weinsteins or Disney. And I, I think it was Disney that bought Miramax, wasn't it? Well, I can't remember. Either way, that's, uh, that's good news for the, um, uh, for the Sherlock Holmes name. Mm. So. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. And also Sherlock Holmes versus versus Harry Houdini, a new graphic novel that uh, should be getting some attention. And so we will have a link to that. How does that work? Is he going to like reveal how Harry does all of his tricks? <laughs> <laughs> Is it, no, I see the rabbit in your hat there. You, you were hiding it the whole time. Yeah. Back into the water jar, Mr. Houdini. You're not done yet. <laughs> That could be interesting. You know, that whole episode of uh, the interactions between Sir Arthur and Houdini and uh, Sir Arthur's reported view, I still find it a bit it is difficult, bizarre, right? difficult to understand it, but his reported view that he felt Houdini had psychic gifts and that that accounted for some of his mysteries uh, – is is more than a little bizarre. Yeah. I know, and and the fact that he got his wife to play along, and you know, she put the uh, in the séance, she put the cross at the top of the uh, the piece of paper there, and the Houdinis, of course, were Jewish. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the jig is up, as they say. That's right. Yeah, um, but yeah, yeah. And then, um, well, I mean, there's lots of links. You can go and and peruse them at your own uh, leisure there, but. Um, We've got our Flipboard. Uh, you can you can flip through there, either online or on your your uh, tablet or uh, uh, smartphone of choice. We also have Scoop It, a Scoop It site, uh, and we've actually been getting some help on Scoop It lately because basically this is a a, a process of uh, selecting, curating, and aggregating the right links that we think are appropriate for. Our readers and listeners, and Jesse Levine. Yay, Jesse! Yeah, she's been doing an admirable job. I turned over the editorship of our Scoop It site to her, and she's been uh, very tasteful in her selections. So, 
uh, it's it's lovely to have the extra set of hands there. Mm. So good. Well, um, do, has, has the time come? I think it Is, has. We feeling gassy. <laughs> No, how do you like that? Do you do you do you feel bloated, friends? <laughs> friends. Do you feel bloated? Do you say, "Mamma mia, that's a spicy meatball"? <laughs> Mamma mia, that's a spicy meatball. Mamma mia, this is a gassy podcast. <laughs> yeah. Well, for this for this episode's editor's gas lamp, we had last time the introduction from Bert Cool's book. 221 BBC. And today we have gone back to January 1952, Volume 2, Number 1, Baker Street Journal, New Series, for a poem entitled Four Ages by Edgar S. Rosenberger. The great Gillette in days of old brought to our hearts a joy untold. In him the master trod the stage grand actor of a bygone age. The cinema made its debut. All London came within our view, and Norwood, Wantner, Rathbone, Brook, gave Holmes a slightly different look. The radio, which has no screen, has brought us Holmes, just heard, not seen. T'was Gordon, Hector, Rathbone, then, and now John Stanley, all good men. A bright new age has come to be, and we would ask expectantly, whose hawk-like profile will be seen upon the television screen? <laughs> Well, little know. little did Edgar S. Rosenberger know it would be Ronald Howard, among others. Yeah, Douglas Wilmer, Peter Cushing, Jeremy mm. Brett, mm. Oh. Benedict Cumberbatch. I've heard of him. Yeah, Johnny Lee Miller. Oh, mm. wait, he's not Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> 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 yeah, so uh, that that's to me that was a really interesting piece because you caught the Sherlockian movement at the dawn of a new medium. Mm. And that doesn't come all that often. Mm. And, and, and even though we've seen the, the Internet gradually creep upon us, it's a little difficult to try to imagine what the next unique medium for Sherlock Holmes might be. Yeah. Any, any guesses, Bert? Telepathy. Telepathy? Drones? <laughs> Oh, no, we already have the drones, but that's P.G. Woodhouse. Uh, the Internet of Things. It will be a, a connected pipe. That's right, the Internet Something. of Things. I don't know. That's right. Uh, it, could, it, could be, it could be robots. Persian Slipper will say my tobacco is dry. Beep. <laughs> <laughs> a tweeting Persian Slipper. I am getting a text message from the Persian <laughs> Slipper. I think this has gone too far. <laughs> Oh, oh, if only the accoutrement at 221B Baker Street could talk, what would they say? <laughs> well, I think some of those articles would say, let me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Not again. General Gordon would probably leap off the wall. The couch says, get off me. You've been on me for three days already. Basket chair. Talk about basket case. <laughs> Ah, oh, boy. Us, the chemical table would say, how many times can you invent the same blood test? <laughs> it's a deal. It is a deal. Well, the deal here is thank you for spending um, yet another over an hour with us as as we've entertained ourselves. ourselves. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's what we're here for. That's when, right. When it comes right down to it. That's working uh, well. As long as we're having a good time, uh, nobody else cares. That's right. 
Well, hopefully you had a good yes, time, too. Yes. Hopefully we're not doing this for naught or, or just for us. Yes. Hopefully we're doing it. So please let us know. Please we would love know. to have your feedback. We would love to have your reviews. Mm-hmm. Uh, so feel free to uh, give us a call at uh, 774-221-7323 or uh, dropping onto iTunes to give us a review. Any of those ways, as we've mentioned at the top of the show, of getting in touch with us, we would be delighted to hear from you. Yes. Yes, we may be crazy, but at least we're not alone. At least we hope so. That's true. That's true. Well, until the next time when we leave you alone and come back here together. Yes. This is Scott Monty saying, you're Burt Walder. That's absolutely correct. And together we say... The game's afoot. afoot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.